There we go. Awesome. All right, so a couple of things real quick. Um, first off, um, as you know, we're kind of crowded today, which we're grateful for. This happens on the first Sunday of every month. Um, we've also added some chairs. So one of the things about uh, our church, it's been growing and growing. And we know in the fall, once school starts, it's going to grow even more. That happens every year. Um, we have kind of tightened the sanctuary up. We've added more chairs. And because of that, that's why we just ask you to just stand where you are, turn around, shake someone's hand instead of walking up and down the aisles because it can get really congested and we don't want anybody run over and get hurt. At you. I'm just kidding. But so we'll, we'll do it that way. Um, we're continuing to meet and or we'll be meeting the uh, elders and deacons and stuff. And and we've been praying and looking. And so uh, we're excited to uh, see what God is doing through our church and and we're excited to see all the new faces, um, and we just pray that uh, you experience God here. Uh, we just pray that you look beyond me and, and this worship team and those sitting beside you, and may you focus on Christ and see Him as you attend um, this church. But may you be encouraged, strengthened, transformed. If you're an unbeliever, I pray you'll be saved, but I pray that um, this ministry through God's hand um, that you will change and that you'll experience God. So the other announcement that I have is um, I have to ask your public forgiveness. Um, so my family and I went on vacation and we left Friday of, well, not this week, would have been last week. And I definitely knew we weren't going to be here Sunday and Wednesday. So I had Larry preach on Sunday, which he did an awesome job. And Jordan preached on Wednesday, which he did an awesome job. But what I failed to do was to think that I'm on vacation all week and it's a non-working vacation. <laughs> I failed to realize that I will be here today and that I didn't have my books with me or anything because I'm on vacation. <laughs> I realized that two days before, and I thought, oh, <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> and you're going, Tim, that is something, you know, and I know I'm just not normal people. The more you get to know me, the more you go, you have a bad mind. Yes. Um, matter of fact, a good illustration this morning. I'm looking at one, trying to talk to one of the founding members of this church. Her name is Melba Goodwin. And I'm going, <laughs> your last name. <laughs> and it just wouldn't come out. So yes, my mind is going bad, I guess. But anyway, so I ask for your forgiveness publicly. Um, I wanted to preach on um, John 4 and continuing, there's two sermons that I want to bring, worshiping in spirit and in truth. And so I wanted to bring that this morning, but I wasn't fully done with that sermon. And I don't want to bring a half-baked sermon because for the fact that I've got a lot that I really want to pour into that. And so I ask for your forgiveness. Uh, today, I'm going to preach to you a sermon I preached a couple years ago. Um, so I think I'm safe because none of you remember my sermons anyways. So... <laughs> Some of you do. Amen. Look at it from a from a child. That's good. So um, the uh, the fourth announcement that I have, by the way, I'm going to have you turn to John first, John three, first, John three. Keep your fingers there. And then I want you to turn to Ephesians five, first, John three, and then Ephesians five, <clears throat> first, John three, then Ephesians five. <clears throat> my fourth announcement is my little girl said, Dad, right before service, Dad. And I said, yes. She goes, would you please not yell today? You hurt my ears. <laughs> so I'll try not to. So I don't think I yell that much, do I? Maybe I get excited. Excited. First John 3, hold your finger there, and now turn to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, I want to talk to, as you already have your notes out, the contrast between a true believer and a false believer. Um, we had men's Bible study Saturday morning, and I was able to attend that. And uh, we got into a discussion about Ephesians chapter 5. And so um, I'm going to, uh, if you will, some say dog tail after that. And I'm going to talk to you about 
um, that meaning of how to distinguish or what is the contrast between a true believer and a false believer. You say, Pastor, is it, um, is it really needful that we understand that? Well, I think yes, in several ways. Number one is you need to know whether you are a true believer or a false believer because you can be fooled. Satan is in the business of fooling people and blinding their eyes. There are a lot of people who believe they are saved because they're trusting in something outside of Jesus Christ. Like it could be attendance, could be baptism, could be money, could be whatever. Work, yeah, a, a form of works. And so they are believing that they are saved and yet they are not saved. They are not born again believers because they are not believing in what is the one essential aspect of salvation and that is Jesus. There is no other name given among men by which we must be saved and that is Jesus, amen? For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it is all through Christ. Um, the other part of that I want us to say is that I, I think it's important to contrast between a true believer and a false believer, not just because you want to make sure that you're a true believer um, and, and not a false believer, but also because of what Paul tells us in this text of Ephesians chapter number five, because it's important that we understand as believers who false believers are because Paul gives us an admonition that we must adhere to and must follow. So notice with me verse one of Ephesians chapter five. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Now, again, Paul is speaking to the church in Ephesus. We know this is a group of Christians. These are believers born again, right? They are saved. They, they know Christ. These are children of God. He says, therefore, be imitators of God. Imitators means to live a life that is an example of God's. Live how Jesus lived. Behave how Jesus behaved. Imitate what he did. Spoke, act, behaved, all those things. He says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But that went along right with communion today. Amen. He says, and walk in love as Christ also loved us. By the way, we walk in love because we are commanded to walk in love. And Jesus even stated and said, the world will know that you are my followers because you have what? love for one another, right? So walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. He gave himself, notice, as an offering, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. He said, <clears throat> by the way, that sacrifice was for our sin to satisfy the wrath of God. Verse three, but fornication, now notice what he says, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not even be named among you. In other words, there shouldn't be people that can go, oh yeah, I know her, I know him. He's a covetousness or he's this or she's that or they're this. Not a, let it be, don't even let it be named among you as is fitting for saints. In other words, it's not fitting that you as a child of God who is to be an imitator of God, be an imitator of the world. Are you with me? So as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So you can see the contrast Paul is giving here. He's like, all these things, you know, the fornication, covetousness, the filthiness, foolish talking, talking coarse jesting. He's saying none of that is fit for Christians. That's what the world is distinguished by. That's how the world is defined by. We look at the world, those who are in the world, those who are unbelievers, and we go, yes, that's them. That's how they live their life. That's what they do. Um, that's how they behave. But not as a, but Christians, excuse me, don't behave that way. It's not fitting for a Christian to live any of that whatsoever. So he says, neither filthiness nor that, but rather giving of thanks for this, you know. Verse five, and here's, here's the big, I mean, the big kicker of when Paul gets into this. He says, for you know, this isn't something that should surprise you. This isn't something that you go, oh, I didn't know that. 
Paul is saying, for you know, this is a fact, and you know this to be true. For this you know, that no, for, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, who has an, excuse me, is an, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. A person who practices, behaves this way, Paul is saying, you know this. They don't have an inheritance in heaven. They do not have a place prepared for them. John 14, as Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If I were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back again and receive you unto myself. But a person who is, Paul says, filthy, foolish, talking, coarse, jesting, all these things, those things which aren't fitting for saints, understand, you know this, that they do not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Verse 6, now here's the key. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. There's a difference between sons of God and sons of disobedience. You understand that, right? So the difference is between a believer and an unbeliever. And here he says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Have you ever met people? And I'm not, I'm, again, don't answer this outwardly. But have you met people who profess Christ, but don't live Christ? Who proclaim to know him, and yet, as we're going to see here in Scripture in just a little bit, their works deny the very fact of what they're saying. In other words, their walk doesn't match their talk. Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty words, saying that, well, as we talked about in Bible study, as Jordan so eloquently taught us Saturday morning. By the way, if you're a man and you want to catch into this men's Bible study, we're in Ephesians 5. We're almost done, but that's okay. We probably got another, the way we're going, another three years before we'll get past the next chapter and a half. Just kidding. That was a good thing, because he's a good teacher. I'm not saying he's slow. I'm saying he's good, because we go deep. Amen? Those of you that, are, well, y'all said amen. You're not even there. Those of you that... <laughs> But we do. We go deep, man. We, sometimes we got to roll up our pant legs. I mean, we go deep, deep in the scripture. And it's like, wow. We say things that they bring up things. By the way, Jordan and Zach and Nick Kemper, Nick, those guys are the smart dudes. And, and I'm just sitting back overwhelmed at some of the things they say. And I'm like, wow, you guys are crazy smart. Um, but I don't let them. I don't say that out loud because I don't want them Enough? Okay, let me move on. Okay. <laughs> I just want you guys to know, listen, it's a good class, man. We really have a good time. You should come. It's at 7 o'clock on Saturday morning. So please be a part of that if you want to come, guys. So anyways, go back to, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, these things, what? When a, when a person says, well, I can do this, I can live this way, I can behave this way, I can do what I want and live like this, because Christ knows me, God loves me, and God loves me just as I am, and I'm saved, I'm a believer, all these things, but I can live this way in my life. Paul is saying, listen, let no one deceive you with these empty words. Because of these things, listen, because of these things, he said, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience because of these things. What things? Covetousness, foolishness, filthiness, foolish talking, course, all these things. The wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. You understand that I'm a believer in, in tribulation. I believe that tribulation is going to be the wrath of God and that it is coming. I believe that Jesus Christ and my understanding of eschatology, what I believe in that the rapture that Christ will come and rapture his church and will usher in a seven year tribulation, which I believe to be the wrath of God spoken, spoken of in the book of Revelation. And I believe that wrath of God is upon the sons of disobedience. 
And Paul says, let no one deceive you. Now notice what Paul says. Now this is important. Notice what he says in verse 7. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Do not be partakers with them. Do not fall into the trap of thinking, well, they're saved, they're born again, and they're doing it. It must be okay. Don't be deceived by empty words. Paul said, therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk. Here's the command. This is the imperative. This is the command. Walk as children of light. You were once that way. Remember when you were a sons of disobedience? Remember when you were coarse jesting and foolishness and covetousness and idolatry and fornication and all these things? Remember that? You were once that way, but you came to Christ. You received the Lord. You came into the light. And now you no longer walk in darkness. You are no longer a part of that. You are no longer in the realm of, but you are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now turn to 1 John 3. With the next few moments that I have, I'll try to speak quickly, but that was just my introduction. So let me get into the meat of the word. Do I think it's important that we contrast between a believer and unbeliever? I, I believe we do. And here is why. Because there are more and more Christians that are deceived into thinking that an alternate lifestyle and something in which God calls sin is acceptable and right and just. I've even heard pastors say phrases such as sins that God has called an abominable sin that now pastors are proclaiming and praising and thanking God that now, which of course now it's not a, yeah, let me skip over that. <laughs> Saying things such as now the lifestyles of those who contradict God's word they're saying things like, glory to God, that now this is coming to the church. That now we understand and that Christians will understand that God accepts all people. Now, I'm going to get way off of my sermon. I don't mean to, but you've got to understand when I say that phrase, God accepts all people. We look at that and there's a way to look at that. We look at that and we go, God loves all people. But in our minds, we're going, God loves everyone the way they are, and they can stay the way they are and remain the way they are and behave the way they are because God loves them. False, right? That is not true because exactly what we just learned in Ephesians chapter number five. God, Paul said, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. All of those things. God's wrath is coming upon them. And he even said, you used to be like that, but you're not like that anymore. Right? You're now children of light. Walk as children of light. But we listen to that phrase and we go, you know, God accepts you for who you are. Listen, God wants you to come to him as you are. But God wants to change you when you meet him. Are you with me? God is in the changing business. He's in the saving business. He's in the changing business. And he wants to do that. And so uh, going back to thinking about, is there a contrast between a true believer and an unbeliever? And should that be important? Yes, because for the fact that twofold one, you want to make sure that you're a true believer. You, you need to know that because people question that. <laughs> Without raising your hand, well, you probably could, but... Um, without raising your hand, how many of you ever questioned your salvation one time? You're like, man, I don't know if I'm saved. Man, I woke up this morning and I just don't feel saved, right? I've done that. 
Or you do, you're just like, man, there's, I'm just, you know, you question it. But it's not until you dig deep in the scripture we're going to find here in, in 1 John 3, you're going to know whether you're a true believer or not. But secondly, it's with that, I think this is so important because we need to understand that those who with empty words say like, I love the Lord, I, I, I'm a believer, I live for Christ, but yet their whole life is just totally contradictory to what they're saying you have to be careful because when you get connected with people like that, they will draw you in to which Paul had said, that's not fitting for saints. Are you with me? I was once talking to a guy here at our church one time, and this was some time ago, and, and uh, it just absolutely floored me. And um, we got into the discussion about... Um, um, baptism and we got a discussion about repenting of sins and and that when you get to be baptized or when you go to get baptized you know that one of the things that is of course faith in christ but it's also repentance from sins and um and then you receive you you get baptized because that's your proclamation to the world that christ is in you you are a believer and, and follower of jesus christ but he made a statement to me he said you know he said pastor you i hope you understand something he goes I don't understand what the big deal is because there's a lot of people that are in our church that I know outside of church and they don't live what they speak. And I immediately went, got my pen and paper. Who? No, I didn't. I did not. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I didn't do that. <laughs> You're going to get a call this week. It's gonna... No, I didn't. But it just, it just floored me. It just over, I was like, what? Because there's, I mean, there's a lot of you I, I don't know. I know you by name when I can get it right, <laughs> right? But I, I don't know you at your house. I don't know where you, at your job. I don't know how you behave and how you act. I know how you are here. But here, here's the thing. I was flabbergasted by that comment. And then I'm thinking, how many believers connect with false believers and get pulled into that mindset that says, this is okay. This is good. Listen, I know people today, and gosh, I'm getting way off. Um, maybe I'll just kind of preach this and we'll leave this for another day. I know Christians today that have been lured into the mindset that is telling them, that, that, or excuse me, that has to been told to them that living an alternate lifestyle is okay. And God ordains that and God loves that because God wants people to be happy and therefore whatever makes them happy, God is for that. And they were drawn into that and I said, no, no, that is not what the Bible teaches. But because they've been indoctrinated with that, these are true believers. These are people I believe knew Christ, but got pulled into unbelievers because these false believers were saying that, oh no, God accepts that, God does this, God, is a, God welcomes this, all this, that they then bought into that. And I'm trying to tell them, no, because the scriptures right here tell us differently. Are you with me? So I think that is so, so important. So with all of that being said, give me, we always close at a quarter of, right? So you know you're here for 15 minutes. You know, I've had several of you say, Pastor, quit looking at the clock. Just preach. Amen. Amen. Who, would, who here wants me to look at the clock? <laughs> look at the kids. All the kids raise their hands. All right. I'm going to talk to your parents when we leave church. Today. I was giving out free chocolate candy bars. I'm just kidding. No, I wasn't. All right, let's look at this real quick. So let me move through this really fast. I won't keep you long, I promise, because um, I, I went too long in my introduction. But let's, let's look at this. I, I think this is very important. So um, the difference between a true believer and a false believer is, is simply their behavior towards sin. You can, John here talks about that. So let's look at scripture. So first John chapter number three, notice what he says. And we're just gonna look at the first 10 verses and we'll close. He says, behold, 1 John 3, 1, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Now, that's amazing. What manner of love? Isn't that amazing how God loves us that we're called children of God? We are his now. And uh, 
he is ours. And so, um, therefore, the world does not know us. Uh, I know I've talked about that before, and I've used this scripture before. The world does not know us because it did not know him. The world will never understand you. Christian, do you understand the world will never understand you? They're not going to understand your love for Jesus. They're not going to understand why you would skip out going to the lake and come to church. They would never understand why you would skip out going and getting drunk and, and worship the Lord. They would never understand why you would give up all this past life and start living for Jesus. They'll never understand why you would do this. They, never, they will never understand you because they don't know you nor understand you. You will be persecuted. You, Jesus even said, hey, listen, I'm just, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. He says, listen, I'm just telling you guys, you're not of the world. I called you out of the world, and the world's going to hate you, and you're going to be persecuted for my name's sake. So understand that he says, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, here's a key. Verse 3. Notice, and everyone who has this hope in him, what hope? The hope in verse number 2. Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. The hope of Christ's return. The hope of knowing that when we meet Jesus face to face, this corruption will put on incorruption. Corinthians, amen? This body, this sinful, sinful body will put on incorruption. And we will be having, we will have glorified bodies. And everyone who has this hope in him does what? Purifies himself just as he is pure. Point number one, true believers purify themselves from sin. True believers are in this constant mindset of purifying themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Not everyone who has this hope in him uh, uh, may or probably or sometimes know it is fanatic. It is an, it's, it's a must. It's a fact. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. So, to, the word purify, by the way, means to keep morally straight. It means to keep oneself free from the corruption of sin. It's a present active verb, which means this is a continual moral purification process. It's not something that you do one time, you come to church, you make a commitment, you lay it down at the altar and then walk away and go, I'm changed. No, it's a constant day to day from the moment. How many of you guys know, you women, everybody here, how many of you know from the moment you open your eyes while you're laying in bed in the morning, it's a process this purification. It's immediate. Why? Because you're thinking about, dude, I got to go to work. And you're already thinking about your boss. And you're already thinking about that coworker that annoys you. And you're already thinking about the work that you got to do. And you got to do this. And this is coming up. And this deadline. And this deadline. And you haven't even lifted your head off your pillow. And you're already like getting frustrated. Can, can I hear a witness? Amen. Amen. And I'm a pastor. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but seriously, it's a process. But it's that consistency of a true believer that is what? A continual moral purification process. In other words, this is a habit of their life. That's a habit. We are in this, pro it's a continual process. I'm, I'm trying to purify myself. I'm not going to be totally pure until I meet Jesus face to face, but I'm in the process of being pure. I'm continually reaching forwards towards Christ. So a true believer purifies themselves. Now notice repentance. Because a true believer are constantly purifying themselves by repentance. Just as everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. We purify ourselves by when those thoughts and those behaviors and things enter our minds. And besides, remember, we just got done in Romans 12 on Wednesday nights. And he talked about uh, uh, purifying our minds. Do not be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. This comes in and we renew our minds first by repentance. And that is, you know, this is wrong. You know, Father, forgive me. It's, I want to stop. That, that's repenting. It's turning away from that sin. And a true believer does everything possible to abstain from that sin. Whatever that thing is, whatever that thing that is hounding them, whatever that temptation is that's after them, they're doing everything they can to abstain from that by, you know, whatever it is. If you've got an issue with uh, social media, get off social media. Um, if you have a thing about uh, watching, you know, rated R movies, uh, get off the TV or don't go to the movies anymore. Make it a place you just don't frequent at all. Um, if you have a problem with uh, caffeine, uh, drinking coffee, I won't go there. <laughs> Give your wife your debit card. Don't carry cash then there's no way you can buy extra coffee. Anyways, let me move on. So here's the thing. 2 Corinthians 7.1 says this. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness, perfecting, making it better constantly. Paul says, I, 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 I beat my body. I bring it into subjection all the time. And so we must cleanse ourselves. We must perfect holiness in the fear of God. Notice number two in your outline, a true believer and a false believer are known by how they pattern their lives. For instance, in verse four of 1 John 3, verse four, a false believer practices lawlessness. I've got five minutes. I told you a quarter of, I'm done. Verse four, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. Now, you say, now, wait a minute, Pastor. Isn't that speaking of believers too? Because believers sin too. No, no, no. You have to understand in the Greek language, the word commit means to practice. It means behave towards. So John is saying, whoever behaves towards or practices, and the key phrase would be practice here. Whoever practices sin also commits lawlessness or not living by the law. What is lawlessness? It means to behave with complete disregard for the law. So he says, whoever practices sin commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. What does it mean to practice lawlessness? It means to continue to commit sin even though you know that it's wrong. It's like when you're going, driving down the highway and the speed limit says 70, and you're doing 80, and you get pulled you can't say, because you just passed a sign that said 70, you can't say to the highway patrolman, I didn't know. <laughs> I can't read. Right? <laughs> oh, I'm sure they had some stories, right? But you know the law. And living outside the law is lawlessness. Outside the law of God is lawlessness, sin. It's living without law. I know what the law says, but I'm going to do it anyway. A false believer practices sin. In other words, you name the sin. I don't care what it is. Whatever the, the lifestyle, whatever they're doing, whatever they're believing, whatever they're behaving, whatever they're thinking, however they're acting, attitude, whatever the case may be, and they know it's wrong. If, even if you just you know, use the word bitterness, people who walk in bitterness, just angry or, or anger or whatever, and, and they're living their life in that such a way without trying to perfect holiness, without trying to um, um, cleanse themselves, as he said, without them trying to purify themselves, but they live in that constant state, that constant attitude, that constant behavior, and they live that way with the attitude that says, you know what, I am this way, this is how God made me, I was created this way, God loves me just how I am, and I'm going to stay the way I am without any repentance, without any remorse, without any change, without any process, that person is practicing lawlessness. There's a difference. A false believer practices lawlessness, and here's why, because they don't know Christ. 
verse 5, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin, talking about Jesus. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Now we're talking about the practice. We're talking about the continuation. Whoever sins, verse 6, notice what he says, whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. This is, this is John now. Whoever makes a practice of lawlessness, whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. In verse 8 or verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. A false believer practices lawlessness because he does not know Christ. Titus 1, listen to this, the pure, to, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing's pure. But even their mind and conscience is what? Defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. Now, they don't come out and deny Christ, it's, it's that working in what they're doing and how they are behaving. They say one thing, but their behavior contradicts their talk. Are you with me? They profess to know him, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Now notice the contrast John gives to the true believers. Verse same six, verse, the same verse, verse 6. A true believer practices righteousness. He says, whoever abides in him does not sin. They don't make it a practice of sinning. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. He who is habitually practicing righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. 1 John 2.29 says, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. You can tell who is born again by their constant behavior of purifying themselves, of, of, of as he says here in verse number three, purifying himself just as he is pure, or for um, um, habitually trying to be more like Christ by practicing righteousness. So what does it mean to practice righteousness? It means to do what is right. It means to behave like Christ. Verse 9, a true believer practices righteousness. Why? Because he is born of God. Verse 9, whoever has been born of God does not practice sin, for his seed remains in him, the Holy Spirit. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Listen, if the Holy Spirit is in you, you cannot practice sin. You can't live in that state of sinfulness and continue in that because if you are, the Holy Spirit is constantly at your heart, at your conscience. Stop, stop, stop. This is wrong. But if you're not hearing the stop, and you're not hearing this is wrong, then there's a problem. You're not born of God. Because when we're born of God, the Holy Spirit, we receive the seed of God. We receive the Holy Spirit. His seed remains in us, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. It's impossible for a born-again believer to live a life of habitual sin because of Christ's seed. God's divine nature remains in us. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. And I'll close with this, and I'm past my time. Let's just close with this one thought. Uh, let's just go to Galatians because that's easier, right? Galatians, let's turn there. That's right before Ephesians. And we'll close with this thought. So you look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. <clears throat> Galatians 5, verse 16. I'll close with this and then the scripture that I have on the screen. But Paul confirms what John is telling us here in John 3, that a true believer follows the Holy Spirit, but a false believer will always follow his flesh. So in verse 16 of Galatians 5, Paul says to the church at Galatia, he says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. 
Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and you know all these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of hate, wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I also tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those, those people who, what, practice such things will not. Again, Paul even said in Ephesians, as we read, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. There is a difference between a true believer and a false believer. And I'll close with this 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11. Do you not know on a screen that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators or idolaters, or adulterers, homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's a fact. Those who practice such things, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, you were just like that. And I remember me, man, I know you guys don't know me, um, but I was, I was there, man. I, I remember the past. I remember the darkness, and I remember the covetousness, the, 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 the fornication, the, the, all that stuff. But when I received Christ, I was born again. I was like that. I was, as Paul would said, were such some of you. But I was what? Washed. I was sanctified. I was justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So I'm going to make it a continued process to, because I am born again and saved, I'm going to walk this way in the direction of Christ. And I am going to do all that I can by my will to say no to sin, to say yes to the Spirit, and to walk and to, to, to purify myself, to, to cons consistently live a life that has a behavior towards living for Christ. On the way, I'm going to fall. On the way, I'm going to trip. On the way, I'm going to see things in my peripheral vision that's going to catch my eye, and I'm going to make a mistake, but I'm going to keep looking for Jesus or looking to Jesus, and I'm going to say, forgive me, Lord. I got off track. I allowed that temptation to grab a hold of me and pull me in, but Lord, I forsaken that, I repent and I come back to you. And I'm going to do that over and over and over and over and over because my goal is to become like Christ. My goal is to represent him, to be his ambassador to this dark world so that when I see him face to face, he says to me, well done, good and faithful servant. To an unbeliever, a false believer doesn't walk that way, but they will walk the opposite way. Their goal isn't on Christ. Their goal isn't focused on purifying themselves. It's not about becoming more holy. It's not about becoming more like Jesus. It's more becoming like their friends. It's more like fitting in. It's more like being acceptable. It's more like being like the world. So there is no persecution. So there is no any whatever bad stuff that would happen to them being called out or ostracized or whatever, a non-believer, a false believer will always go in this direction. Now, they talk like they're going in this direction, but they're behaving that they're going in this direction. Do, I, do you understand what I'm saying? And it's important that we understand that because listen to me, and I'm closing with this, but listen, if you're in this direction, you need to repent means to turn around and follow Jesus. You need to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And if you are going in this direction and there are those who are behind you going the opposite direction saying, hey man, you don't have to worry about that. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Listen, don't hang out with those people. Witness to them. Tell them about Jesus because they need him, amen. Pray for them. But be careful. Be careful. Because they will pull you down. And they will tell you that it's okay to do things, as Paul said in Ephesians 5, that aren't even fitting for saints. You were in once darkness, 
but now you are children of light. Walk in that light. Walk in that light. Let's pray. Father, Father, I thank you that you saved me years ago. I can't imagine where I would be today. And Father, I've had to ask for forgiveness so many times because I've allowed things to catch my peripheral vision in my walk with you and I've allowed things to catch my attention. I've allowed Satan is what I've done. I've allowed those temptations to hinder my heart and I've allowed myself to go in a direction many times that I didn't want to go. But when you, Holy Spirit, woke me up, broke my heart, convicted me, I repented just like David did when Nathaniel came to him and said, David, you're the man. You're the one that sinned. And I've repented and I've asked for forgiveness and I've had to do it over and over. And I'm so grateful for the day, Lord, that as Paul said, <laughs> in this flesh, I have nothing but sin. And who's going to deliver me from the body of this sin? I thank Jesus Christ, my Lord. For one day I know that this corruption is going to put on incorruption. I ain't going to have to fight it anymore. And I ain't going to have to repent anymore. I ain't going to have to deal with temptation anymore. Because one day, Jesus, when I see you face to face, <laughs> it's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. And I'm going to have a glorified body. And not just me, but everyone who names the name of Christ here this morning. Father, forgive us where we've stumbled and forgive us where we fell. And if there's anyone here this morning, God, who is walking in sin, who has, who has caught the temptation of the devil, and they're walking in a path they shouldn't be walking on, Holy Spirit, as you are breaking their hearts even now, and as you're knocking on their conscience, God, may they repent right now and say, Father, forgive me. I know that I've sinned, and I've done this thing, and I repent, and I'm, I'm done. And I turn to you, Lord. I pick up that plow back with both hands and I'm going to follow you. And God, I pray for those who are being tempted at this very moment that God, that you would also shake them, that they would see what that temptation truly what it is and that it's sin. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time to gather together as your believers and your children. I've enjoyed being in your presence, Father, just to hear your word and as it speaks to me, even things as I'm preaching, it speaks to me. And I'm so appreciative to be able to be with your people that encourage me and I just love rubbing shoulders with and having fun with. And Just thank you for this day, Father. It's been an awesome day. Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we leave this place. I pray, God, that you would continue to spur us on to good works, that we as your believers would pursue holiness and righteousness. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, I lied. I'm 10 minutes late. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I hope and pray that you can say you were glad that you were in God's house today. And I pray that you were transformed by God's word, not by me, but by his and if you are an unbeliever today, if you've never received Christ, please let me know. And let me close with this one thing. I've said this before, and, and I, I, I just want you all to understand that I know there's some of you that may have filled out guest cards, and, I, and if I've forgotten to contact you or I've contacted you like a long time ago, if I've never been to your house, I've never brought you a pie, you want to know more about the church, please let me know. I want to come talk with you. Love to share a cup of, well, not share a cup. We'll have two separate cups of coffee. <laughs> That's a little joke. But seriously, bring you a pie and discuss about the church, but I'd love to get with you. So if you haven't done that, if you'll fill that card out, you can drop it in the offering box as you leave today. Put your name, address, and everything. And mark on the bottom where it says, I want to know more about the church. I'll contact you this week now that we're back and get a time that I can meet with you. But God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today. I pray that you guys have an awesome week this week. You are dismissed.